Welcome back to the Front End Coffee Break. This is season one, episode 14, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, my name is Ricardo Torres, and with me, Chucho Castañeda. How are you, man? Hello, all good. Today is actually a very quiet afternoon. Um, I'm uh, for a change. I'm drinking a regular coffee, not a decaf. I've had not that much coffee today, but nice. I'm enjoying one last cup of the day because otherwise I'm going to be like this at night, and we don't want that. <laughs> Great, man. Um, yep. So, what's the topic that we've chosen for today, Chucho? Well, it's a very interesting topic because um, we have specialists for it. Although we do have specialists for it, we as front-end developers and anyone as front-end developers should know about it, which is web performance or performance. Uh, I thought per you were se. going to say like work with Chira or Excel <laughs> spreadsheets. Okay, but we're, okay. not, we're not about to torturing people. We're not about uh, torturing people. Regardless. We cannot talk about Jira. We don't talk. It's like if it was a song, it's like we don't talk about Jira. Da, 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 da. Precisely, precisely. What performance? Yeah, so I think you and I are also like technical interviewers and we, we all would love, love to ask um, candidates about what performance. And I think you and I as well on our careers, we've been asked this question like dozens of times. Somebody comes to you, client or project manager, and they ask you, hey, Chucho, can you look at this website and can you make suggestions? That's it. You don't have access to the source. They just give you a domain mm -hmm. and they tell you, can you give me suggestions? And then, of course, what would you look at? Apart from the UI or design, you look at performance, right? And this is something, and as you said, as interviewers, uh, and this is for people that are planning to do interviews as a front-end developer, I think that performance is important. And sometimes some interviews will ask precisely this question. Imagine that you have a website and, you, and your client says, hey, I think it's too slow. What would be the things that you would uh, look into first to see why that website is slow? Yeah, I think you already said in the beginning, I think it's important to know that, okay, even though there are web performance consultants and specialists that only work with the performance and they mm. are gods in their expertise and their field of expertise, uh, I think all front-ends, all-rounded front-ends should at least know the basics of web performance because when you're coding, you should also be able to, you know, code thinking about performance or advise the client on performance, even though you're not the expert, maybe you, you cannot do this uh, comprehensive analysis and, and use cases, sure, you, you must be able to at least do some of that. Um, so tell me, Chucho, what would be one of the tools you would use to um, look at performance on a website? Well, definitely the developer toolbars is like the go-to thing to do. I mean, and you have this in basically any any browser. And even the, if they don't have specific performance uh, tools, because some of them actually have very nice, very interesting performance tools. Well, well, we can mention them a little bit later, but at least you can, the first thing that I would go to, and this is something that you can find, is to take a look at the network. One of the biggest things that, that I'm amazed when they put it in perspective, I think that, I don't remember the quote exactly, but they were saying like, a website weighs more then if you have a text file with all of Shakespeare's uh, uh, um, work, Books, I don't, yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't remember if it was more or less like this, but it did put it into context. Like you have this huge amount of of text, and you can put it in a file, and it's still gonna be smaller than a lot of the websites that 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 are, that are out there. So the first thing that I would do is always take a look at the network uh, tab and see what's happening there. What are we downloading? How many resources? How big they are? And that would be like order based on size and see what's cooking. How about you? Yeah. What would be besides this, of course, uh, what other thing would you suggest? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of going to Lighthouse. Most mm. like it, it's my, my first like, okay, it's synthetic testing, but it's my first go-to. I just go to, sure, open the dev tools, go to the Lighthouse tab, and then just run it for desktop and mobile. And it will give me very quickly uh, the, the, most, the most, let's say, high-level overview. Okay, if, if, I, if I have, I don't know, big images that I'm being, I have resizing them, or I have render blocking scripts, or I don't know, too many things in the DOM, things like that. So that's already very fast for me to, to gauge before I deep dive into, okay, what's actually going on? Should I follow or not the guideline? Because of course, as you know, Lighthouse might tell you stuff, but you don't always have to follow it to the letter. Yes, and that's one of the most frustrating things, and this is something that you that I would suggest uh, for developers. Like, don't worry too much about Lighthouse because it might say, "Hey, you have a script that it might not be. You should make a make it smaller." And it's like, 
why? Oh, because it's going to save this amount of seconds. Like, well, maybe it's not a good idea to make it smaller. So it's a good thing to a good starting point, as you say, but you don't have to feel obligated to follow the lighthouse to the fullest. And it's interesting that you mentioned this because um, we're basically when you look at lighthouse, yes, you're getting a very good insight regarding on what performance issues you can have, but they are based on what Google thinks should be <laughs> things that you should take care of about performance. Uh, yeah, so this is, it's a complicated topic, right? They have the, the monopoly when it comes to, to search and probably mm -hmm. your client is going to be interested in on Google and they have their own browser. So, I mean, my, my heart's like divided because on one side, I don't like monopoly and I use Brave for search on my personal mm -hmm. uh, devices and I use Firefox as, as, as a browser, but I do also respect that they're pushing so much. Uh, the web technologies. I did. They have these web.dev portals, and they try to teach a lot of us in 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 this community to to just you know be more aware of stuff. So that mm -hmm. that, that I, I respect. Um, what else do you do you use Tucho, apart from Lighthouse and DevTools? Well, I think that that would be. I mean, I have to be honest. That would be basically the 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 biggest. Uh, well, Lighthouse or Lighthouse like. Um, solutions, you know. Explain more. Tell me more. <laughs> Because I mean, it's you take a look at at the browser tools. Uh, there's, as I said, there's a lot of tools that can help you out determine how the page is behaving. You can just record the network and not only see what's downloading, but also how the interactions are playing out, what, ja what JavaScripts are are being executed, how long they take. I mean, you can really go deep into the deep end regarding the use of these tools. And as I said, I'm not an expert in this. I know about them. I sometimes you look at it and it's like you're looking at uh, um, ancient Egyptian writing, which is said no. jeroglyphics. <laughs> But there we, we do have the performance experts that can actually read that. Anyhow, um, when I say Lighthouse-like tools, because we talk, you talked about Lighthouse at first, is other uh, developer or other tools out there that can give you an insight regarding on what's happening on your website. But you have, for example, websites that you can give a URL and they can check your, your page for you. Like web, I think th this would be one of the most used, a web uh, page test, which is like this huge thing that you have an amazing and incredible amount of different options that you can put there. And... The thing is that you, the minimum thing that you can do is put the URL, just click next, 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 yes, 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 and then you get something very similar to Lighthouse. But then again, you can do so many more interesting things like, oh, I want you to test with a mobile phone. Oh, I want you to test with this. I think you can even, I don't know if you can go through browsers, but well, you can like personalize quite a bit. And not only that, I think, um, I saw the, the performance the expert that we have that you can add scripts that you want to be executed before the page or things like this. I mean... It's amazing. It's just a huge uh, thing to, to know. And that's why we have experts for it. Yeah, definitely a web page test is the, the, the go-to like for, for professionals. And if you want to look professional, just, just, just use it. Uh, as you said, there's just too many options. You, like, you can throttle as well, like the, the network, because mm. mobile and desktop and browsers and throttle it. Do like second view panes because the first view is going to be cached and the second one is faster. And I love that uh, when I need to get serious, serious on, on a side project or whatever, I, I just go there to, you know, record, compare. You can compare hmm. one to the other URLs. It's, I mean, it, it, it's a holy grail, right? You have everything. The one also I like, uh, because you already said the keyword, you said insight, you said page. <laughs> There's page speed insights also from Google. There's a website where you just put the URL. And, and the cool thing is that, okay, it gives you sort of lighthouse, but it gives you real user data. That's very, very interesting, right? So Google, uh, if you've toggled this, I think I don't know if it's opt-in or opt-out on your Chrome browser, mm. they can like get stats on your on the usage. So you visit whatever website, cnn.com, and they will store that and then present it if you do a page speed insight on CNN, the data there will be from real users. And that's super interesting because it doesn't really matter how good the synthetic is or, or how bad it is if your real users are doing something different. Like, for example, let's say that Lighthouse says, okay, you have a low score because you have just too many, too much JavaScript, right? Mm -hmm. You say, okay, that, that's a lot. But then when you go to insights, let's say your users only use like the latest mm -hmm. iPhone and the latest MacBooks, mm -hmm. which are 4,000 euros. Maybe for them, it doesn't really matter because it, they're so powerful, the machines, right? Because your, your, your real data, your real users are just using super powerful machines and you don't really care gaining 
one millisecond or 100 milliseconds or 300 milliseconds by trimming down JavaScript, right? So I, for me, it's interesting to look at the real data. I was very surprised when I found this out because I I always thought that it was like the, the web page test, but not as powerful for Google. That was just like the... Um, if you didn't have Chrome, but you wanted to do testing, you could, if you were working with Brave or Firefox, you took your URL, you went there and you pasted and it would give you a, a lighthouse experience. But no, I was surprised when they told me, no, no, it has real data. If I'm not, not mistaken, the last month of real data. So that means that if you actually do a change um, on, on your website and you go to the week after that, you go to the, the, the page speed insights, you're not going to see any change yet. Because I, I think you have to wait around a month before they do that. And if it's not a month, it's the important thing is that they have you have to wait a, a certain period so that they collect enough data with the new website to actually see a changes. So it's important that you take into that into account. If you're using that tool, you have to know that it's not the freshest data. But the interesting thing is that it's real data. It's data with uh, everyone that's using Chrome and didn't opt out, as you said, well, they, they have information um, from that. And it's it's super nice, especially, for example, um, one of our clients has uh, websites uh, that are um, in different countries. You know, we have here in Europe and back in Latin America. And there's uh, you can put the URL for each one of the countries and you're going to get a slightly different uh, response. Why? Because the data is different because the users are different. Maybe you see people that are using more phones in one place than another. Maybe you see people using desktops or maybe a faster computer or faster connections. And this can affect the performance experience. So you have to take that into account as well. And this tool is nice for that. Yeah, exactly. I think I had the same thing on my project. I thought my, the website we were working on was a slow. I felt a slow for me because mm -hmm. I saw so much JavaScript, but then the performance experts came in and said, no, look, I mean, with the real data, it doesn't, it's not slow because users, it's mostly in Europe, they use high-end devices and it's not, not so bad. So I was okay, I'm happier now. <laughs> All right, so tools. Um, you said man, you mentioned DevTools at the beginning, which is <laughs> fantastic to go to the network and you see, of course, I mean, in the network, what do you see? Like uh, well, JavaScript, CSS, <laughs> let's talk about those. Let's talk about how can you, as a web, uh, no, sorry, as a, as a front-end developer, how can you improve your JavaScript? Any Any tips? Well, one of the things that you, you we take for granted because we think that that's the way it has to be is compression. And, okay. You know, and um, there are several types of compressions. You have at least two two points of uh, that you have to that you can reduce the amount of the size of your text. One of them is by uglifying it, that they call it, which is basically just um, reducing the amount of of uh, the sizes of the names of the variables or the functions, and you basically just uh, make a smaller amount of, of text. So it's it's like a reduction. Re you remove spaces and such. And then the second one would be the compression that is done by the server, if you have that. Or um, when you deliver the, the file, it's actually compressed, which is something that I didn't learn until some years ago, that the, the, the file was served compressed. And then the browser just receive it and uncompress it. So compression would be like the tip number one that you have to take into account when delivering anything, CSS or JavaScript, even HTML. Yeah, that, that's a little bit of the right hole. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I went into that, although, although the area is more of operations or, or system administration because mm -hmm. they have mm -hmm. to enable GZIP or broadly compression or whatever it is on, on the on the server. So that, that's more of the area. But at least you as a front end need to be able to go into the network and see the the, the, the headers of, a, of an asset and say, hey, look, it's not being... Uh, it's not using GZIP or it's not using Broadly. So you have to tell them, hey, please do that, right? And then, of course, minifying with build tools that you might mm -hmm. have, right? Um, Webpack or ESBuild, whatever it is, to, to minify the code. Uh, yeah, I mean, serving unminified code, unless it's like three lines, uh, I mean, it feels <laughs> like you, you should be doing I mean, it's for free, right? I mean, just minifying it, it on your local or, or in a continuous integration system, just do it, and then the users get, get less less things for free. I think that's a given. Uh, what, what about CSS? Any, any any techniques that you might uh, encounter or think about when it comes to improving performance? Well, there is a, a big story about CSS precisely. I I think that my the most experience that I have improving performance has been related to CSS precisely. One okay. of the, the previous projects that I worked with uh, the client really was very much into making sure that the website was was as optimized as, as possible. And without, and this is something that's going to sound funny, but without analytics, 
the, the external JavaScript analytics and these kind of things, and without personalization, which can also reduce the performance, it was a really fast website. It had really nice score, but you have to, well, we, we had to include analytics, we had to include personalization, so um, the website wasn't as performance as we would have liked. Anyhow, um, in CSS, I did work on trying to improve uh, the 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 uh, um, the performance using some techniques. Once we changed from HTTP one to HTTP two, and uh, actually the project had, and this is going to sound, I mean, uh, it, it was an interesting thing. We had four different priorities to load CSS. You know, um, the first one was, and this is important, if you have very important CSS and you don't want to include it in line, because that's the fastest thing. If you want a CSS to be there as soon as possible, you have to include it in line. You put it inside the, either the as part of the HTML in the style uh, property or attribute, or you include the style tag with the CSS inside in the HTML. This is like the fastest thing that you, you, can, you can do. The second fastest thing, if I'm not mistaken, is to push the CSS file. Whenever the, the, the browser requests a page, you say, hey, it's fine that you're going to request it, but you should also get these CSS files. So like you push, you do an HTTP push, if I'm not mistaken, that's the, the term, and basically tell the browser you really need to, to load this CSS as fast as possible. Then we had um, what we call the normal uh, the CSS loading, which was uh, a CSS file just as, as, as always, with the normal priority and everything. And then we had what we called the um, asynchronous loading in CSS. And it used a very interesting technique in which you say that the CSS is for a different media than the one that it's requesting it. Like, for example, you can say this CSS is for print media and then have a JavaScript that unloads when it, the CSS finished loading to transform that attribute media print to media screen or to remove it. The interesting thing is that the browser will actually say, mm, okay, so this CSS is is not I don't need it, so it gives it a low a low a lower priority. And once the other ones have been loaded, then it starts loading it. And finally, we had lazy loading CSS, which was on, only loaded at the very end. Once everything once everything was loaded, then it started loading the CSS. What could it be? For example, the footer. The footer was not something that you would see at first glance, so it waited for the very last moment to actually uh, load it. Interesting thing, when you open the network, the, the toolbars, you could see the cascade, the four different areas of how the CSS was being loaded. I said four, I didn't count the inline. Right, so inline, like critical critical render path and having, yeah, I, I thought, well, I think that uh, that's one of the things that has most impact, like, at least for me, what, I, what I've tested in, in my it project is. or side projects, like, okay, you have your fat CSS or multiple CSS files that load components, footer, header, side, whatever it is, right? But if you put at the very top of your, of your head your, your style tag with just the, the, the most interesting so interesting. The most critical <laughs> things above the fault, again, this, this keyword mm. above the fault, uh, it will really make a difference because then the browser will immediately have, I don't know, let's say background color, the, the basic font, font family, and the, I don't know, the, the box, the main box for the app. And that will render immediately. And then, of course, as, as soon as the things are discovered, they will be downloaded and, and afterwards. But, it, but yeah, having the critical render path there, critical in, uh, uh, styles in line really changes stuff, yeah. We tried to do a lot of experimenting on this part because, for example, I at one point I suggested we never implemented it. That, for example, the above the fold, as you mentioned, is uh, for those that don't know the term, it's more related to papers. When newspapers, when you know it's folded, and whatever is above the 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 fold, <laughs> it was a, a called above the fold, which is the most visible part, which is like right. the prime um, stage. Space, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. Um, the CSS, I mean, you, what you want to get printed faster is what the user can see, but you can never know exactly what the user is seeing because you it's very hard. I mean, especially as time goes by, devices are so varied. You can have long tablets, short tablets, wide tablets. You never know. Anyhow, um, one of the things that we were trying to figure out is like, okay, what if we every time that we request a page, we push a CSS as an inline element, um, but physically there in the HTML? But only those that are above the fold. It's impossible to know, you know. So one of the of the things that we try to do is like let's put it inside the first three elements, for example, and the rest are loaded normally. So we never implemented it, but that could be a, an interesting solution. I mean, yeah, with, with like content management system is very hard, right? Because you don't know how the authors will actually build or lay out mm -hmm. the page. 
I mean, if you have fixed components, that's different. If you have a fixed header, sure, and a fixed hero banner, okay, fine. Yes. But if it's really a free for all content, uh, it, it's it's hard to know um, without backend uh, what what's first, what's second. And All right. So we've talked about JavaScript, CSS. That is fantastic, and probably one of the most important uh, things to look at and that makes sites very very slow are images. Yeah. How many times have you encountered DevTools open and it's like okay. Eight megabytes site, and then it's three megabytes one one background image, and four megabytes something like that on on the footer. What I do you do this. there? What? The background <laughs> image, the three megabyte right, background right. image. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. It is, it is, and also also like maybe you have, have or, or like hero. I mean, so you and I know about HTML, we know about responsive, and all. we also ask this question so many times. You no, know, how do you do if you have a hero image that needs to work on mobile and on desktop, you want different sizes because one is vertical, one is horizontal. The the, the wrong answer is just to load several image image stacks and then display whatever, but the browser mm -hmm. will download it anyway, and it's super slow, right? So that might happen. Anyway, what do you do with big fat images? Uh, there's two things that, that that you do. One of them is precisely um, one thing that we mentioned, which is lazy loading. Right now, there's even a native um, solution from, from browsers. And if you put it and browsers don't understand it, it's fine. It's not going to break anything. So that would be like the number one, lazy load. Try to lazy load all the images. And number two, well, that's number one. Number two, choose correctly sized images. I mean, why do you need a 2,000 wide a picture for a thumbnail, you know, and there's sites that actually use huge images and there are tags like the picture tag and um, uh, even the image tag that you can use to determine the different image sizes based on the, not only the viewport, but you can even do it based on the, on the size of the space that it's actually um, taking over, uh, taking over, um, that it, that it occupies in the yeah. page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is like, Basic thing: Don't ask for images that are bigger than the ones that you need. But this one is hard, Chucha, because um, okay. So if you are the the whole owner or maintainer of the website, you are the quote unquote webmaster, and you can own your content and everything. It's easy. But when you are handing over the content to content editors, it's hard for front ends to to not know okay if the mm. user will drag a, a fat image into the widget section, which is you know four hundred pixels only, right? So may, maybe there there you need some some back end love to to yes. Limit that somehow in the front end. It's it's hard. They actually, in the, with the technology that we work with, AM, the it has its own uh, the dam, um, which is the one that handles the, these kind of resources. Um, it has its own system that you can load an image, a big image, and it transforms the image to smaller versions of it. And when so that you as a as a front end, once you know the image sizes, you can actually ask for okay, I don't care what image they uploaded. I want to use an image that it's at most four hundred pixels wide. And nice. you can make sure that the, the, the image is actually that size. And that's regarding, for example, with technologies that we work uh, at Cognis and at Centri. But there's also yeah. other solutions that can deliver the best, most optimized image. Now, yes. Go I, ahead. Tell, tell me about CDNs and, and matches. The CDN, well, yeah, yeah. There's there's the CDN solutions that, that actually do this. I was going to change a little bit of the subject because of subject because of something that I want to mention, but I'm going to wait until we finish the with the images. What would you, for example, suggest uh, regarding images? I mean, the first one you said, I think it has the most impact, like lazy loading. I mean, hmm. you, you would not believe, or listeners will not believe how, how much it changes. Like if you have a site, a regular news site or a blog or something that has a bunch of images and you turn on and off, like adding this, HTML attribute called loading equals lazy with the images that uh, underneath it makes such a difference on, on the page speed it's mm. it's it's lighting fast and it's it's for free because all major browsers now now support it and and the funny story is that I think was it maybe a few weeks ago I uh, I had this change request on my project to actually drop the JavaScript implementation to do lazy loading on images for the native one because we were supporting all browsers and we had to do, of course, JavaScript, hmm. intersection observers and all this crazy yeah. stuff. But now just one attribute, you delete all the JavaScript and it makes such a difference. I, I just love it. So <laughs> go ahead, change topic. I just want to say that. Well, um, what I wanted to say is that in, we mentioned JavaScript and CSS, but there's one that we haven't mentioned and it's interesting because it's something that happened to me many, many years ago and it was something that was solved as a backend. Well, when I was doing uh, backend uh, work as well, which is the HTML. Yes, I'm sorry. I was I used to be a backend as well. Um, and it's we had this client that had huge pages, but like a huge, huge page with a lot of the history of of the of the user. 
and it was all HTML, okay? So it was like, let's say, a four megabyte page of pure HTML. Yes, that's the way that he wow. had it. Wow. And we noticed that two things, though, the page wasn't compressed. And the other one is that uh, it was also it was the text it wasn't even compressed as well. The, all the spaces were there. So you open the page and you had tabs and spaces and everything, uh, however the templates were done. So what we did back then, uh, we were using, um, look, it's been some time that I don't remember the, the, I know that it starts with S. Anyhow, we were using a, a backend framework before Spring. It wasn't Spring. It was uh, before, uh, I was, I was going to say Scrum, but it's not Scrum. It'll come. Anyhow, we were using this uh, backend uh, framework that you could create your own tags. So we created a personal stack was, that was called Remove Space. We added it at the beginning, at the end. It removed all the space. And I remember that we got uh, an improvements of uh, 60% up to 60, 70% less of, wow. size, of page sizes. And it was just removing the spaces. And so that's why it's important to compress. Wow. Yeah. I mean, definitely for a small pages, maybe it doesn't make much difference, mm -hmm. but for big HTML, sure. Yeah. Minif in minifying all the old HTML makes a difference. So we forgot. Two things images. now and I, I, I see my notes here. <laughs> yes. So for images, one very important is next generation formats, hmm. right? Because maybe not, not all listeners know that, okay, long are the days or of you uploading PNGs or, or JPEGs to, to the website. Now, most of the browsers um, can read, for instance, WebP, right? Which is a more compressing format now with the new AVI format as well. Sure, you might have web pieces that are bigger than JPEGs. You have to choose well your mm -hmm. compression settings and removing metadata and all those things. But but think about this next generation format. And when you ask assets to the design agency or whatever, please ask on these new formats because probably your browser matrix is going to support them. And, and it makes a difference because I mean, on some JPEGs, you might get 50%, 40% discount. So yeah, it's free. Uh, that's one thing. <laughs> And Another thing that we forgot <laughs> to mention about, about JavaScript is how to load the JavaScript. Okay. So how do you load JavaScript, Tucho? I put it at the very beginning because I want it to be super fast. Um, okay. That's good. If you were born in the... <laughs> no, no, just we, we used to do that. We used to do yes. that back in the day. Yes. Uh, that, that, and that's fine. We, we forgive ourselves, but now we know better. Um, so... If you want, again, free optimization, there are two simple attributes that you can add to your script tag. One is the fur, the other one is the sync. Let's not go into detail on what, how they mm -hmm. work, but basically you are just deferring the downloading and execution of JavaScript until a certain moment. Right? Uh, and it's important because JavaScript is render blocking. Mm -hmm. right? if, if they, when the browser starts reading your page and they find a script tag, they will stop what, they, what they're doing, download the file, execute whatever logic is there, and then continue rendering. Mm -hmm. And that could cost you know, a blank page because yes. you have maybe four scripts at the, at the, at the header. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, your thoughts? No, I, I, one of the first things that you learn as a front-end developer is that put the JavaScript at the bottom of the page. And I've had in so many interviews people when you say, hey, where do you put the JavaScript? And you don't say anything other than where do you put your JavaScript at the beginning or at the end? And they always say, oh, at the beginning. It's like, would you put it at the end? And th those are the, sometimes people say, oh, at the end. And when you ask why, they don't really know. And it's precisely because of what you said. You can put it at the beginning if you use uh, the attributes, the deferred attributes or a sync, depending on what you want to achieve. But it's important to put it at the end because it render blocks. And I think this is a very important topic that uh, based on the time that I see that we have, we might as well just leave it for our next episode, that it's it affects the user experience. Actually, performance, it's about that. It's about user experience. Everything that we're talking about, to, it's important to, to improve the performance for many, many, many reasons. But in the end, the most important reason is because you want your users to have a good experience. And when you render, when you block the rendering, render block you, with a JavaScript, you get a blank page. And the user is going to be like, WTF, what's happening here? What's going on here? <laughs> I agree with you 100% on the, on the user experience. I mean, do you agree that that's what Google is pushing for with their own Core Web Vitals, those metrics that measure large content from pain, interaction, and all those things that, okay, they're numbers, but they're based on like what the users are doing and what the users want to do on your website? I think that they're really not completely on point. Not, they're not perfect, but they are going in the right direction. All the the, core, the Google Core Web Vitals, um, they are 
there we, uh, to try to measure the per, the the user experience how it's impacted by the, by the performance like for example the largest content tool paint you want it, the user not to be waiting that much on, on on an area that it doesn't take that that long and the others are based on this and it's very important yeah yeah i mean i i like it i mean i like the, the like I really hate when when websites jump on me. So they, they start loading and I and I see that I need to click a button or something and then suddenly the button goes away because of course layout shift and things like that yes. because yes. they didn't save the space or they didn't prioritize images or something like that. And it's like it's very annoying because I yes. was I was about to tap and then the, <laughs> the button is gone. <laughs> And so, so pay, pay attention to that. Uh, it will really affect your, your users and yourself if you use your website. Um, so kudos to Google for that. There are a bunch of resources on, on, the, on web.dev and their own website. So, so check them out. They're free. And PageSpeed Insights, they'll give you also data on that. Hmm. Um, there are a bunch of articles on, on our website as well, I think, on, yes. our, on our blog. Um, we will link them in the, in the show notes. So, so please check them out on web performance, like font performance I see here. Yes. CSS loading that you wrote, by the way. And uh, there, yeah. there's a, as I said, there's a, a lot of we have a, a community of web experts, of performance experts, and they are a community that is actually creating um, articles, analyzing constantly. I'm I'm surprised about the amount of work that they put on, on this. I mean, it's a huge, a huge thing. So if you're really into web performance, I really recommend you to look for performance articles in leanetcentric.biz website. And with that. Um... I thank you, Chucho, for joining. Thank and you, Ricardo. <laughs> and I thank myself for also joining. <laughs> the listeners for being here, for leaving a comment always on our, on our YouTube. Anyway, like, subscribe. Thank you so much, guys. I'll see you in the next Frontend Coffee Break. See you.